during an episode titled Coda from Season 3 of the popular science fiction show Star Trek Voyager, Captain Catherine Janeway is directly confronted with a reincarnation soul trap matrix. After having their shuttle struck by ion lightning in space, the captain and her co-pilot begin experiencing a time loop where every time they seem about to perish, they instantly revert back to the moment just before being struck. Janeway slowly starts recognizing this incessant déjà vu and begins to worry that she may have died. In reality, they had crash-landed on an alien world where her body lay dying, where her consciousness was having a near-death experience. Suddenly, somehow back on the Starship Enterprise, out of a bright white light steps Captain Janeway's long-deceased father, smiling and in full captain's uniform. "'Who are you? Are you responsible for what's going on here?' she asks him sternly. "'You know who I am, Catherine,' he responds. She shakes her head. "'My father died over fifteen years ago. You may be a hallucination, or some kind of projection of my own imagination, but you are not my father.' The entity insists that he is indeed her father, and that she died in a shuttle crash. He claims to understand her confusion, and to have gone through the same feelings when he passed away, explaining, "'I went back to you, your mother, and your sister, after I died for a long time, until I realized it was futile. That's what happens when death is unexpected. One's consciousness isn't prepared to let go. Still skeptical, she quips back, Consciousness? Is that what you're calling me? Catherine's consciousness? For want of a better word, he answers. Some say ghost or spirit. We all heard the stories and thought they were the product of vivid imaginations or self-induced hysteria. I'll admit, I was surprised when I found out they were true. Catherine continues to test the entity claiming to be her father by asking questions only he should know. He answers convincingly, and details her family's actions during the days after his death, insisting that he was there in spirit, watching over her, her sister, and her mother. Eventually, you will cross over, he says. The only question is how long it will take you to give up this world. Cross over to where? she asks. I don't know what to call it, he replies. Another state of consciousness, unlike anything we ever could have imagined in life. It's not a frightening place, Catherine. It's full of joy and indescribable wonder. Captain Janeway's father leads her to a room on the Starship Enterprise, where the crew are now holding her funeral. After the final speaker finishes their last teary, heartfelt goodbye, her father interjects, It's over now, Catherine. There's nothing left for you here. Come with me. What do I do to leave here? she asks. Just decide he answers. The only thing that keeps you is your refusal to leave. Catherine acknowledges that she simply isn't ready to accept it, and wishes to stay in spirit with her friends and crew. Her father responds, You're saying all the things I told myself when I refused to leave you. I was hoping you wouldn't have to go through that. It's a horrible existence, Catherine. As time wears on, you begin to see how potent, how destructive loneliness is. You'll see the people you love going on with their lives, doing all the things you used to share with them, but you won't be a part of it anymore. You'll forever be shut out of their existence. It becomes agonizing. I don't want that to happen to you. You can only be an observer of their lives, never a participant. Every hour you stay here makes it that much more difficult to leave. Defiant and unyielding, Catherine sternly snaps back, saying, I don't care. I'd rather be here in spirit than not at all. A captain doesn't abandon ship. Why are you pushing me? I've made up my mind. I'm staying here. Then, just as she makes this decision, her dying body lying on the alien world begins to show vital signs of coming back to life. For a brief instant, her consciousness shoots back into her body. Lying there on the wet, rocky ground of the alien world, looking up through her physical eyes again, at the doctor and co-pilot. She sees the resuscitation effort underway to save her. In this moment, Catherine realizes how the white light entity was trying to deceive her. I didn't see myself, she said. I was looking up at them. That's the real me, isn't it? Lying on the ground on that planet dying. 
And this is the hallucination. This isn't real. Her father begins to scowl, losing his patience, shouting, More denial. You're only making it harder on yourself. I'm trying to save you unnecessary pain. Catherine refuses to relent and notices, You're trying very hard to convince me to come with you. Why is that? If what you're saying is true, why not let me come to that decision on my own? My father would never act like this. He always believed I had to learn my own lessons, make my own mistakes. He never tried to shield me from life. Why would he try to shield me from death? You're not my father. I could be imagining you, but I don't think so. You have such a specific agenda. You're determined that I go with you somewhere. Who are you? Are you an alien being of some kind? Is that it? I was right. You're an alien. You created all these hallucinations, haven't you? Acknowledging his exposure, and finally admitting defeat, the entity explains, This is what my species does. At the moment just before death, one of us comes to help you understand what's happening, to make the crossing over an occasion of joy. And what is that? Catherine asks, pointing at the bright white light from which he appeared. Our matrix, he responds, where your consciousness will live. I was being truthful when I said it was a place of wonder. It can be whatever you want it to be. Shaking her head, she asks, Then why didn't you tell me this from the beginning? Why pretend to be my father? The entity disguised as her father reasons that Usually people are comforted to see their loved ones. It makes the crossing over a much less fearful occasion. I've done this many times, but I've never encountered someone so resistant. Captain Janeway narrows her eyes in condemnation at the deceitful entity. I don't get the feeling you're trying to make me comfortable. You're only interested in my agreeing to come with you. You don't strike me as any kind of good Samaritan. You're more like a vulture, preying on people at the moment of their deaths when they're most vulnerable. What's the real reason you want me in that matrix? Somehow, I don't think it has anything to do with everlasting joy. In a last-ditch effort, the entity grabs her by the shoulders and demands, You must go with me. Unfazed, Captain Janeway makes the astute observation that if you could force me to go, you'd have done it already. You need me to agree, don't you? I have to go voluntarily. Let me tell you this. We can stand here for all eternity, and I will never choose to go with you. With that, the entity concedes defeat, but warns her, You're in a dangerous profession, Captain. You face death every day. There will be another time, and I will be waiting. Eventually, you'll come into my matrix, and you will nourish me for a long, long time. This episode of Star Trek Voyager perfectly encapsulates the typical near-death deception experience. After being drawn towards a bright white light, entities often claiming to be deceased relatives present themselves as afterlife guides to help assist with their transition. They praise and hype the light as a place of overwhelming abundance, joy, and love beyond anything ever experienced on Earth. They patiently answer every question, clear up any confusion, then begin nudging the near-death experiencer towards entering the light. As Captain Janeway wisely notices, the entity pretending to be her father is unable to physically force her into the light. His only power is to mentally and emotionally deceive her so that she might choose the light of her own volition. Thus, the entity cloaks himself in the body of the most loved and respected authority figure in Catherine's life. He relays stories and information that only her father should know to solidify the illusion. In order to scare her from waiting around in her disembodied state for too long, he warns about the agonizing loneliness and futility of staying. He insists the light is a place of joy and wonder where she can manifest anything she wishes. But when she finally adamantly refuses, the pretense of patience and understanding wears thin. The entity's forceful behavior exposes his cloak of compassion, and it becomes obvious that it is not actually her father. Like a pushy used car salesman trying to force an impulsive purchase, he gives false answers and makes false promises. If the white light was really worth the price of admission, 
why would it need these sleazy salesmen in their cheap meat suits to sell us on it? The entity's final comment gives the clearest clue when he says, eventually, you'll come into my matrix and you will nourish me for a long, long time. In other words, our entry into the light seems to serve as some kind of energy extraction that feeds these entities. Similar to how Morpheus bleakly described the human condition in the Matrix movie, we may ultimately be nothing more than batteries farmed for a type of energy.